at different times, different contexts are going to have different sorts of salience. So sometimes the most salient context is going to be a, uh, a friendship relationship between two kids. Sometimes it's going to be your classroom. Sometimes it's going to be your um, school. Sometimes it's going to be the neighborhood. Sometimes it's going to be the city of Philadelphia. Sometimes it, it's going to be political discourse in the United States. Okay, so here we are. Uh, it's nice to see you again, Michael. Nice to see you. What a pleasure. And uh, I guess people should know that uh, I've had the, the pleasure of working with Michael and studying under him in a couple different settings. And uh, Michael, get ready to be surprised a little bit. Uh-oh. When I, when I woke up this morning and did a bit of a brainstorm, can you see the screen? Yep, I can. I said, what do I think when I think of Michael Smith? And I just quickly typed up just some things going through my head. And uh, I have a lot of associations with you. Some of these are direct quotes. A lot of them are just general concepts. So my goal for today, just a heads up, is to kind of briefly and broadly touch upon a handful of these. And maybe a lot of them, I kind of think of these, some of these as maybe your greatest hits and uh, just things, at least for me, that I've learned from you and, and, and hold on to. So how does that sound? Maybe just kind of talking about a couple of different ideas. That sounds great. Cool. Okay. Now, and some of these ideas, um, uh, they're sort of like ghosts, I guess, in my mind, whereas like they're, they're memories of things that I knew, mm -hmm. I knew were important, but I don't have any substance to them anymore. So. Part of this is just uh, selfish for me to sort of reconnect with some of these old ideas. And then others are, they're not just bones, but like the meat is on the bone and it's succulent and I could take a bite out of it completely. So uh, we'll see how it goes, all right? Yep. Um, but first, uh, how is, how would you say your, your, your current work is, or your current job is compared to others you've had in your career? Well, I'm not dean anymore. Okay. So, associate dean anymore. So I went back to faculty. So it's very, okay. much, it's very much like the, the job that I had when I was, um, at Rutgers. Um, oh, okay. So, so, so I'm overseeing the English Ed graduate program. Um, the course I'm teaching now is a composition methods class. So it's 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 similar. I think when you were um, at Temple, doing the PhD work, you. Mm -hmm. I was chair, wasn't I? Yes. Yeah. So it, I'd been in, in part of my role had been in administration for some time. Got but it. I'm, I'm back to teaching. The biggest change is that one of my projects is I go to a a Philadelphia neighborhood high school once or twice a week to work on a a project, a pathways project, mm -hmm. where we're working on on helping kids, all of whom are, would be first generation college students, mm. to prepare them for the rigors of college reading and writing. So we're doing um, a focus on sort of argumentative okay. reading and writing. So that's the biggest difference that I'm going, you know, a couple times a week to, the, to that school while I was obviously before the yeah. schools closed. Oh, okay. So, so I really, really enjoy that, yeah. Good, good, that's nice. So in that program, is there anything uh, that you've added to your repertoire as far as teaching that population? Or do you, are you kind of pulling from things that you were already like using often? I would say primarily that. So we, we built the instruction around essential, a, a set of essential questions or existential okay. questions. Um, so what there were, so for example, one of the questions is to what extent am I responsible for other people? Huh. Right now, the, the juniors are working on um, what does it take to be resilient? Mm. The seniors are working on um, to what extent and in what ways has media influenced our lives? So what's coming up for the juniors is what does it mean to be to belong? What's coming up for the seniors is um, 
to what extent can we understand each other across demographic differences? Mm. And so because it's explicitly, uh, it's being uh, funded by Ernst & Young and it's got an explicit preparation for college focus. I guess the biggest, there are two differences, I think. Um, one is that there's a greater emphasis on non-literary texts okay. because we want to prepare them across disciplines and at Temple anyway, you can, there's, there's one required class that students take in which they're likely to read some fiction, mm -hmm. uh, but you can, again, at Temple, you can go through without reading, unless you're an English major, without reading a literary text. Mm -hmm. um, Interesting. And so that's, that's a different focus. And this, I guess the second is that um, one of my students, John Philip and Brenda, has convinced me of the utility of using um, something I did a little bit, and probably we did it in, 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 at, at Rutgers, where I talk about problems to engender conversation to use semantic differential scales. That's really at the top. That's really at the heart of the practice. So we'll do um, a way that we get them to position themselves and then need to create an argument is to use, intersperse the reading that they do as a way to generate talk with semantic differential scales. So, and they, they can vary. So they can be something about author so that you could ask, up to this point in the piece, the author is expecting readers who agree with the author mm. or disagree with, and then you would fill out the scale and then you would, then we would say, what, what, what makes you say so? And we would do the, you know, try to foster development of, of argument, or it could be about, you, we could ask them to make um, an ethical judgment about a character's actions if it was a literary text that we were reading. So based on your reading of the story, the, characters' actions were entirely justified, entirely unjustified, as, as an example. So, okay. so that it, that's really at the center of the work that we're, that we're doing. So with the scales or, or even the ethical judgments, what, uh, what motivates that approach and what do the students get out of it? Like, what does it enable them to do? Because I, I see that as a bridge towards something, yes? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's what, it, it, what it does is create the occasion for argument. Mm. If, the, if the scales, it does a couple of things, I think. If the scales are good scales, um, it, it creates the occasion for argument. Um, just because there'll be, I mean, typically there's some variation. So I give it a six, I give it a four, and then I give it a yeah. two. And then we can, then you've got moves to make because you can say, you, then you say, what makes you say so? Mm -hmm. it, can you explain? So you would, you know, you would, help them develop that. I mean, help them sort of walk through as a, as a class or as a small group, um, developing a, an oral argument. Um, okay. the, other, the other thing I thought, it's, um, I think of it as a way of giving students an easy in, because once they mark the scale, I've mm -hmm. got, it because if you ask a question, it, it it, it requires sort of a fully formed response. If you ask them to make a mark, mm -hmm. as soon as they make the mark, then they've committed themselves to something intellectually. And, and we can, we can well, why'd you, why'd you mark it there? What makes you say, tell me why? Well, you, the person next to you marked it a different place. Tell that person why she made, why she's wrong, you know? So we can, it gives, um, and, and I think that one of the things that we're interested in doing is to developing, um, we sort of located in theoretically in um, helping to initiate students into a community of practice. And so the expectation of that sort of discourse is not one that they come into the class sharing. How would you define that term or explain that term community of practice? Because as we're well, talking, as we're talking, Michael, it, I could imagine I could imagine even future teachers or new teachers getting a lot of uh, benefit out of the conversation we're going to have today. So how, how would you define that kind of simply? Well, I, I would say that there are different 
that every community has a different set of expectations for what constitutes, for the way one talks, the kind of talk that one engages in, um, the kind of writing that one does, and, and so on. And, and there, there's a, an expectation for, so for example, um, there are class, there are kinds of situations where what's expected, I mean, obviously nothing new, is for students to, to make short answers that are sort of filling in the blanks of the extended discourse. And what we're trying to, um, what we, our argument is that at university, that changes. And if that's our target, that we need to begin to help students understand how to participate in an ongoing discussion in situations where there are multiple sustainable that need to be defended. I mean, that's what the academy, that, I mean, that's what, that's what we're doing here, kind of, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, you're asking me questions about my position. Mm -hmm. it doesn't come in a vacuum, but it comes with an awareness that there are other possibilities. And so in some ways, I'm, you know, I'm crafting an argument for the utility uh, or, or the va and, and value of some of the approaches that we're taking. Mm. And so really it's, it's a way to engender this, this sort of feeling that, that as a class we are, going to, we are grappling with some issues of import together and that in order to do that, we have to articulate the positions that we're taking, be open to changing those positions, but also be willing to defend our position and listen to the defense that other people are making of, of theirs. I mean, that's what I think that sort of scholarly work is supposed mm. to do. Okay, and, and I would say one of the things that uh, you've always done well in, in my view is to create that easy in and create some sort of fun, like early on, like something sort of light, sort of fun, uh, an easy hook sort of in the door, mm -hmm. and then the more uh, academic or scientific -y concepts sort of come later. Would, would you say that? the characterization of your approach? Yeah, it, it is. So I try, but well, we're, we're just, I'm just working with uh, one of my students on um, this. Can we really understand each other across demographic differences? And I think the first activity is going to be a, a case. And the case is going to be my story where I, uh, European American male adopted, uh, a daughter of color who also has a learning disability. And at one point, Catherine said to me, um, something like, I know you love me, dad, but I am a black adopted woman with a learning disability. You can't possibly understand me. And, and so the, the question, so what, I'm gonna write that as a case and mm. then have students do a semantic differential scale to what extent can the dad understand the daughter. Oh, that's cool. One side will be completely, one side will be not at all. And then there's going to be a ranking activity underneath that where they say, which of the factors, which of the following factors most um, affect the ranking, uh, the rating that you did? Her race, her gender, her generation, her learning disability, other. And so that would be a way to sort of prime the pump. And then we'll read then we'll read stuff that, that takes that up. So you might read, I don't know, some, some we haven't worked this out yet, but we might mm -hmm. read something like um, a Deborah Tannen's about how genders, how people across gender speak differently. We'll probably, um, or, or read something about how the speech patterns in for working class people are different from those. We have a little, New York Times article that we'll probably use about how people don't understand each other across social class. Um, so we'll, we'll get, so we'll take up then, so we sort of prime the pump, you know, these are the things that we're going to be thinking about. And then, and it's obviously an important question, it's obviously an open question. Mm. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm thinking about now. I'm going to write that today. Cool, cool. So, yeah. so you're taking some straight up autobiographical stuff and uh and then sort of just twisting it into a like a third person little anecdote well, i guess 
it's what uh, the autobiographical stuff is what generated my interest in the question. Okay, all right. The school, I mean, the school that we're, it's a 100% free and reduced, free or reduced lunch. Um, primarily African, primarily African American and um, Puerto Rican, kids of Puerto Rican descent in, in the school. Um, so, so there are also lived issues for them, right? And so, um, so we, we, we think that, we think it's an important question for them to think about um, and that there's a lot of work that's been done across us because remember we, we want to prepare them for the rigors of college reading and writing so you could read base Bernstein or some excerpt you see what I'm saying to get them in a context where doing that reading is going to be rewarded because we get a chance to participate in a question that's worth thinking about okay and so early in your career would you be as willing to take something personal like that and turn it into a is this is this a, is this a simulated text is that what that yeah it, means? that's a, yeah that's that would be okay. a simulated yeah. So is that something you've grown no, that, more comfortable I, I, with later in life, or you were always like that? No, I, I, I think I've always thought that. Okay. Is there well, anything? Go ahead. I mean, what I when I talk about the um, when I talk about devising the questions, I mean, one way to generate the questions is stuff that you're interested in, yeah, um, or things that have sustained conversations for you across. Hmm. I mean, my daughter's 30 now, and so it's wow. been something, and my, yeah. And, <laughs> uh, Hello, Catherine. And, and Rachel is coming on 30, so the, um, those are questions that our family has been asking for a long time. I know it's got the capacity to sustain conversation because we've, we've done it. So one of the ways I think that you can think, I mean, certainly you can get questions from, your students' lives or what's happening in the community. I mean, that's a great thing to do as well. But I think that I can also be reasonably confident if something, I, if there's something I've been thinking about for 30 years and talking to friends about, and, and yeah. so that it, it's probably can, I could probably sustain six weeks of work on it in class. Yeah, absolutely. Now I'm trying to make a decision whether I want to go for big questions or small questions. Uh, I'm going to go for a mid-sized question. Is there any like principle of teaching or any concept that uh, really has and still like means a lot to you personally? That's a wide open question. But. Well, you know, I'm a student of George Hillock's mm -hmm. and um, George believed that you could, that if you gave kids data, a, a data set of a topic of interest that that could engender meaningful social activity that would lead to develop, developing reading and writing skills and strategies. So that, I mean, that's in some way or another, I mean, that's what he, in his in his research on writing, that's what he calls the inquiry approach. Mm. It's at the heart of what he calls the environmental instruction. He he's known more for his work on writing, but that he thought the same thing would be true for 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 reading. I think that I'm a little bit different from George in that um, George. I think I think texts are opener than than although I'm relatively conservative about the nature of meaning. But I think less conservative than George was. Um, so yeah, so that I, that's been at the center. I mean, that's what I. What so my first question as a, as a teacher would be. I mean, is this is this something worth talking about? And then what kind of what kind of data can we use? And those data typically for George's students um, involved are involved in what Judith Langer calls creating a set of simulated texts. Hmm which are texts or that focus one's attention on particular, they're designed for particular instructional purposes. So you can see it, I mean, you can see it, I think in, in my work and uh, Tom McCann and Betsy Kahn, uh, Carolyn Calhoun Walter, 
uh, the work that those guys do heat or some. So that would, that would mean creating simulating simulated text, not necessarily like searching or finding for them. Well, I found both it's more fun and faster to write them myself. Okay. So if I know going in uh, that the dimensions of difference of demographic difference that I want to think about are race, class, gender, and disability status, it, which I did, which I think are um, my student wants to add religion to it, but Catherine was brought up of, I mean, I could write something of a different religion, but I'm going to set it in the family and we can add to that. Um, if, if, I, if I know that I can write, you know, I can write this. I don't know that I could find a, a single text that would have all of those dimensions. And so here I can make it happen without forcing it, if you see what I'm saying. So I, sure. I, I found them easier to write and, and I like writing. I mean, they're, they're more fun. It's my, it's, I don't know, my, my little, okay. the, the, the kind of creative writing. Got it. Okay. So that, so I guess from a Vygotsky in sense that might, that might fall into the category of uh, creating artificial conditions for development to happen. And, and what I mean is that, you know, you're, you're manipulating these simulated texts in a way that is trying to push things in a certain direction. And I, I don't use the word manipulating in a negative sense. No, no absolutely. That's what a simulated text does. Yeah. I, I, or, or I don't know. I, I mean, I, I told you I'm nervous about talking about. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I, I, I would have thought about it as a psych, as, you know, as, as a psychological tool that the text mm. comes. And really what happens is then it's not unusual for that to be a touchstone that we come back to throughout the whole whole unit. And it becomes a way of um, understanding and responding to in both reading and uh, as a reader and a talker and a writer, um, the other texts with which we engage. Okay, so it sort of functions as an anchor and then you'll, you're likely to get into more complex or difficult to read text along the way. You can always anchor back to the original experience, yes. which was uh, the easy in or the fun experience. Um, and this, especially if it's under the umbrella of some compelling uh, or authentic essential yeah. question. I like what you call the existential question. Well, that's, but that's pretty John, easy to visualize. That's pretty easy to visualize yeah. how, you know, if you have a good question, you have some sort of a compelling anchor set of activities, especially if it's composed purposefully, that sets up, mm -hmm. that's, that sets things right. up. Right, and, 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 and then it sets up your selection of text so mm -hmm. that whereas the simulated text gets all of those dimensions, then as I said, we can read, um, okay. we can read something from, from somebody who writes about gender differences and communication styles. We can, uh, we can read something, um, about the um, okay boomer phenomenon that focuses on generational hmm. standing, but I've said this. But the initial the initial case sets the sets the stage that would then I we can sort of parse out in some kinds of ways. It would be hard to find something. I mean, I'm, I, I, I think it would be hard to find a text that would take up in an efficient way all of those issues that we want to, you know, put on the board at the beginning of the unit. So, yeah, so it's, it. It, it's absolutely artificial, engineered, manipulated. Yeah, yeah. Is, is, now a, is now a reasonable time to get into this conversation? This is called the inquiry square, I believe. Yes. Or is there not a natural transition here? But, um, I don't know if there's a natural transition, but. Okay, how, how about we just make an unnatural transition? And because okay. I, I think this is, I think this is a, a concept worth digging into a bit. Yeah, well, this is, um, so one of the things that was on your list is bad teaching I have done. So okay. I, and so, um, so anyway, this is, this is some work that, that George did that George Hillax did that um, I've been using in the hand of him, Jeff Wilhelm and I have amended somewhat. Mm. So George made the argument that um, the center, the center for 
um, matrix is of his devising. So he said that what writers need, both declarative and procedural knowledge. Declarative knowledge is knowledge that you can say. Um, procedural knowledge is knowledge that you have to perform. And then he said, you need to, writers need to know about the form or genre that they're trying to produce, as well as the substance, the stuff about which they're going to write. So that sets up a two by two matrix. Mm -hmm. So declarative knowledge of form and different, different approaches to teaching writing have relative, put different emphases on different aspects of this matrix. So declarative knowledge of form would be, I, I mean, an easy example would be that an American style haiku has three lines, 17 syllables, 575. Mm -hmm. A declarative knowledge of form would be the knowledge of, of, of grammatical structures. Mm -hmm. So, the, you, you know, uh, this is uh, how, this is how, the, these, this is how these things go. This is how things, right. That, you yeah. know, lead sentence has, so that would be declarative knowledge of form. So, so grammar, mm -hmm. grammar instruction, um, most models, most instruction using models is declarative knowledge of form. So they mm -hmm. would or you, you see the, or those um, diagrams where they say that, you know, the inverted funnel or the funnel or something like that would be declarative knowledge of form. Mm. Declarative knowledge. Of, so those approaches then, the argument for those approaches is if I know what I'm supposed to do, then I will be able to do it. Declarative knowledge of substance is I think what characterizes most um, writing in the disciplines, or in, in English class, it would mean, okay, we spent two weeks talking about this book. Mm. You know this book. Go ahead and write about this book. So if you know the stuff about what you're going to write, then you'll be able to write about it is, I think, the underlying argument. And you could see how that would happen in different, um, in, in, in different disciplines as well, where, okay, we've studied the Civil War. Now I want you to write about what you think the most important impact of the Civil War on post-Civil War economies in, in the North. I'm, or you see what I'm saying? So that, in other words, you know the content, then you can write about it. So I think that, they, that writing both in English classes and in other classes, that instruction in writing, typically focuses on declarative knowledge. Um, Oh, I, I, another example of declarative knowledge of form would, it would be if I'm teaching a research paper, what I do is I give students the MLI, MLA or APA guidelines. Those mm -hmm. are the features that I'm asking them to produce. So, so procedural knowledge is knowledge that you have to perform. So procedural knowledge of form would be, um, so if I've got a model that says you need to start with a hook, which would not be uncommon, is mm -hmm. how, how do I write one? Okay. Um, procedural knowledge, so that would be, that would be procedural knowledge form. And the, and, and the most neglected square is procedural knowledge of substance. And procedural knowledge of substance is the strategies you use to get the stuff about what you're going to write. Mm -hmm. So we were studying with me at, in a PhD, as a PhD student, I think one of our major, we talk, for example, about how do you do an interview that's going to get people to talk? Well, that's mm -hmm. a procedural knowledge of substance. How do you get the stuff? We talked about how, we spent a lot of time thinking about how you're going to analyze these data. So that's procedural knowledge of, of substance. Procedural knowledge of form would be, you know, let's talk about a variety of ways that you can embed qualitative, your qualitative data into, into a research paper? What are the moves that you're going to make to introduce a quote? What is the, if you, if you see what I'm saying. Yeah. So, and, and then the, um, so the, the now, procedural is very how oriented, H-O-W. The procedural, how. yeah, ab, it, it's absolutely. Yeah. Um, and the, what the two outside circles are the, um, the contextual features. So there are the immediate situation. So we need to be mindful of how that's being done. So in your classroom, 
as an idioculture has uh, has certain sorts of um, certain sorts of of norms and um, power relations and, and so on that we need to be mindful of in the way that these these things play out and then the wider environment does too so if i'm hmm. a student who's writing to if i have a student of lower social status who's uh, who's doing a six on a semantic differential scale and is talking to a kid with a higher status who's at two there's something more at play than just making the argument right so i have to be mindful of that immediate social situation can you say just a tad more about that not exactly following well so that um if you're if you are making an argument to someone who you think has more power than you you might you might have a tendency to do more hedging mm. than you would just as as an example um you might make more moves to make sure that your um the person to whom you're speaking recognizes that you've listened to her argument with care you, you so i know that you so i know that you um so what i'm understanding you to say is da 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 da, da and you would you would do that that's not a move that you would necessarily make there's someone might say well you know i disagree with that mm, got it. and there's a difference between those two those there's a difference between those two moves that are informed by that might be informed by the immediate situation that 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 you're in so when you and i were in conversation you were probably <clears throat> and and we disagreed about something my disagreeing with you were play, might have played out differently than your disagreeing with me because mm. we were in, um and that's partly informed by by the wider situ, by the wider situation so that would be the, the what's happening in schools uh that would be something about the um uh, uh well <sighs> I mean, one of the things that we see happening in, in schools is, is that we need to be mindful of, I mean, discourse has become, public discourse has become more, more polarizing. And so stuff that's happening in classrooms is, you might have to do a different kind of work in schools to get kids to do, um, to get kids to do a, um, a I, I don't know, fully developed argument because that's not what they hear, right? So that would be the wider. So, so the, my classroom environment is informed by the stuff that's happened outside. Okay, so so almost uh, I've heard the metaphor of the classroom environment as sort of like the dojo, and then the real world as as like the uh, street, so to speak. Whereas, uh, if you want certain things to be uh, to teach certain things in a pure form, like within the dojo, that's going to get you something. But if you if you wanted to travel or be useful out in the real world, then you have to possibly temper some of your idealism or bring in some uh, uh, some realities from real life, or perform um, or or not change or keep the same idealism, but recognize that the discourse that you're producing might have to change in order to achieve that like so, yeah yeah i do right. yeah yeah like yeah. specific and, well i was just going to say that i'm so the um you, you know the so i did this idea of it's in cultural psychology in, in where cole's got this diagram of nested contexts right mm. so at different, at different times different contexts are going to have different sorts of salience. So sometimes the most salient context is going to be a, uh, a friendship relationship between two kids. Sometimes it's going to be your classroom. Sometimes it's going to be your um, school. Sometimes it's going to be the neighborhood. Sometimes it's going to be the city of Philadelphia. Sometimes it, it's going to be political discourse in the United States. You see it. So, yeah. so there are, and at different stages, um, I, I think typically the classroom is the, is often the most salient context, but we need to be mindful of the other contexts that affect it, and that sometimes those other contexts are what's going to matter. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Um, 
so when I when I teach argument, some of what I've done, I guess, over the past few years is bring in a little more persuasion into argument, and uh, so maybe using the concept of rational persuasion, which is a Kevin De La Plante idea, which means there's argument and there's all the formal components, and there's a good argument versus a bad argument, but then there's elements of persuasion and influence and things that actually uh, operate on our non-rational minds. So like the argument is sort of addressing the rational parts of us and the persuasion is addressing the, the realistic parts of us because we're not really very rational typically. So I, I guess what I'm getting at is, a, uh, I'm not sure, so maybe, maybe creating a hybrid between the two pure form within the classroom and then the, the form that actually really works like, or, or, or I should say allows you to see things that maybe allows you to see reality in a way that maybe uh, a, a strictly argumentative classical approach wouldn't allow you to see. Is that making any sense? Yes, I understand. I understand the issue, but it's not a distinction that I make. Hmm. So that um, so one of the things that we work that we work on, uh, 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 I think, de depending upon who your audience is and the nature of your claim, different kinds of evidence are going to matter, and some of those, some of that evidence will be more what people would term more rational than others. But so one of the things we, we try to help our students understand is there are times when stories are the best evidence, mm. where, where anecdote is the best evidence. So I guess that that would be on a persuasion side, but if um, if I'm, if I'm, or some sort of, um, if I'm arguing, to what extent am I responsible for others? Mm. I, don't, I, I think that telling a story about a time when somebody helped somebody might be the, the now that has, an, I, it's not, I don't know, the way that you're describing the rational, that would not have a place for that, but that, mm. so, I guess what I'm saying yeah, is that- Yeah, that's, that's very hard. That's like almost going through the heart or through the gut to the head. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, as opposed to simply just trying to go like head, <laughs> head to head all the time. Right, no, and there, and there, but yeah. there, is, there is a risk of that. Um, um, John Philip and Brenda, he was the first, pers the first of my students to work with me on this project. I mean, he wrote a paper um, about how s students and we, I'm not sure how 100% successful we are on this, but that students regarded um, arguments as a set of enumerated facts, yeah. right? So they're the only thing that mattered. But now that's problematic for two reasons, that it sure. suggests sure. that the status of facts, that, that oh. you think that that's a fact or statistic is not self-constructed in the same way as story is constructed, um, but it also leaves out it leaves out personal experience as something upon which you, you can draw in making an argument. And especially one of the things we want to try to do is, um, did you take a course from Eli Goldblatt? I did, yeah. I enjoyed him so, very much. Yeah. So Eli, when Deb Brandt and Eli's idea of sponsorship is that you write as a representative of a sponsoring institution in some kind of way. And a sponsoring institution could be something from, could be your religion, right? It could be hmm. your, your family structure, it could be something like that. So the, the more that, so recognizing that we want to create occasions where those drawing on the, the institutional authority from outside school in some kind of way, or, or you have a, um, if you've got a kid in class who's a, who's a sports, who's an athlete, they can draw on the institutional support of their sport in some kinds of ways. So that they could say, um, teamwork is the, and teamwork is the most important thing. And here's how I know in this idea to what extent am I responsible? Notions of team and being on a team might be germane, right? And so we want to create situations where they can draw on that kind of sponsorship and that might matter as much as a study on when help becomes enabling um, in some sort of psychological investigation for so so they can draw on different they can draw on different things
we're also talking about some some bad teaching you have done, which is I know one of your phrases that you like yeah. uh, regarding this square. Can you, can you get into that a bit? Yeah. So I want to talk to you about how I um, how I first taught the research paper. The high school at which I taught, eleventh graders had to write the research paper, and it was a big thing. Um, and so when I I did did I thought just a smidge about um, what's the difference between the other kinds of essays that they were writing and a research paper. And what I said, thought was, well, the big difference is that they have to write, uh, and I'm old enough, we, we wrote footnotes actually, but you had to write notes and, um, and a bibliography. So what I did was, um, I did a couple of things. I mean, I did as a, as a teacher, I handed them out the bibliography form that we were gonna be using. I wrote a, um, put on the board, I did a four by six card, like drew a rectangle on the board. And I said, when, when you take notes, you put the last name of the author and the page number that you found the information on, you put a header and then you write. And then I gave them a list of dates that things were due. So the 15 note cards, bibliography cards were due this time, note cards were due this time, um, rough draft, final draft, and so on. So, uh, so what I got was when I collected the, when I collected the cards, they were full of stupid stuff. Um, and then they wrote their papers and they were full of stupid stuff. Mm. And, and it, they, were, they were hard to read and, and they got the bibliography form wrong anyway. So then the next year I said, okay, well, what's the problem? So I went and I said, okay, this year we're gonna practice doing the bibliography form. So I brought in like title pages of books and so on. Mm. So if you're gonna write a bibliography entry for this book, what would you do? And so we practiced that. So then I did the same thing. I drew the four by six card on the board and I, you know, topic, author, page. And then they, they, they were writing on whatever uh, public, I, well, they were writing on whatever topic they wanted. They had to get it approved by me and I'd approve it and then they would write it. And um, this, this, so that second year, uh, I'd collect the cards. They were full of stupid stuff and the papers weren't very, were full of stupid stuff. And then the, um, but the bibliographies were right this year. So. Okay. And of course you realize you're telling a story that every teacher can relate to. I, I yeah. yeah well, well, you know, whether it's, whether it's no cards or something else. Of course. Yeah. But, the, but so, so finally, I mean, and it took me, a, it took me a few years. So finally I said, well, um, what's the heart of the matter in writing a research paper? So that's been something, uh, uh, this, a concept that I've been using in my teaching more and more. It says, what's the heart of the matter? So the heart of the matter in writing a research paper is in Stuart Green's words, to mind text and reading to write. That is, that you've got, to, in order to advance your argument, you've got to, um, you've got to be able to understand how somebody else's work fits into what you want to do. So that means not just filling out 15 information cards, 15 note cards, it's finding a number of occasions where you can use somebody's work to leverage the writing, the argument that you want to make. So, or, or, the, or, or possibly even the story that you're trying to tell. Oh, the story that you're trying to tell. So, um, so over, so that's once I once I came to that realization, and then you have to be able to use that in some way to advance your, your argument. So then, all of a sudden, things things change for me. Um, mm -hmm. Not all of a sudden. I mean, over a series of years. So once I recognized that. So what we did, it was, we did an 11th grade classes, typical of my school taught um, American literature as in 11th, in 11th, in 11th grade. Mm -hmm. So the research, so my students, the first time, then we started to th I think about, well, using the information and modeling this is what I want to, is what I want to do. So we read, had read Catcher in a Rye, and then the, the question that they did their first research paper on, was to what extent was Holden a typical or pathological adolescent, uh, young adult, right? Mm. So I did the research 
I gave them information from a variety of psychologists. And then we talked about when do you paraphrase, when do you quote, we mm. talked about using that. And then we did, um, we took and put aside the, um, the literature and we did a series of public policy arguments where we did, we did, we played simulation games. We did one on whether the, our village should have gun control. Um, and so they played, we played a simulation game where I, again, I did the research and then we did another simulation game um, where they had to do the research and then they, we, would do, we would play this out and then they would end up writing. So my, my point being is that if we look at this, if we look at this inquiry square, um, there are two kinds of knowledge. I mean, this is something that was developed by George Hillax. He wrote about this in a, in a, in a paper some time ago. But he, he argued that, um, say, he said, psychologists say that there are two primary different kinds of knowledge, declarative knowledge and procedural knowledge. Declarative knowledge is knowledge that you can say. Procedural knowledge is knowledge that you have to perform. And then he says, writers have to know about both form and substance. And so then he set up this new, or this two by two matrix to declare where you have declarative knowledge of form, declarative knowledge of substance, procedural knowledge of form, procedural knowledge of substance. And what happened was, I, in my bad teaching, was focused on the declarative knowledge of form square. I, if the idea being, if they knew what an information card was looked like, they could then write an information card. Now, procedural knowledge of form is being able to produce the formal features that you've talked about. So we could talk about how to punctuate a quote, that would be declarative knowledge of form, but procedural knowledge of form would be knowing when to quote, when to paraphrase, how to, the frames that you use to introduce somebody else's work into your own writing. So that thing that I did with Holden and, and the, the psychologist was helping them develop procedural knowledge of form, that is how do you use the information from somebody else. And then procedural knowledge of substance was how do you get the stuff? So we, after we had those simulation games, we were thinking about, well, what are the things, what's the evidence that matter? You know, so we, we did activities like, so let's, everybody has an article, here's what the topic is, find the best piece of evidence, and then we develop criteria for evidence. Mm. Um, so that's procedural knowledge of substance, that's how, how do you get the stuff about which to write? So the problems that I had teaching the research paper was largely a function of the fact that I was not, was that I didn't recognize the heart of the matter. And the heart of the matter is, the heart of the matter is to um, mind text and read to write. So to have, to be positioned, to do your reading, having a sense, I mean, as you're, not saying that you have to, that you're not learning from the reading that you're doing, but have a, a sense of your position or learning about a position so that you can then use what you're reading in order to make an argument for that position. So that's, that's the heart of the matter. Um, the heart of the matter in teaching a haiku, declarative knowledge of form for a haiku is an American style haiku, 575, right? Mm. But the heart of the matter is to see a natural image with new eyes, right? Mm. If you notice something that's worth spending those 17 syllables on, that's the heart of the matter. Um, Declarative knowledge of form for a story is, you know, the, the rising action and climax and denouement or something like that. But the heart of the matter is having some interesting characters who are placed in a setting and then being able to render or being able to figure out what's going to happen in, with these actors in this, in this setting, if you see what I'm saying. So that, the, and, and so typically, the heart of the matter is going to be related to procedural knowledge of substance. And what I've been trying to do, like when, what, that's become a sort of term of art in my classes. Well, the heart of the matter here is what, and it, it really what matters is, if I, so if I'm going to teach, in, if I'm going to teach a particular kind of writing, you know, what, what's, 
what's its central feature? What's, and, and I think we, uh, so here, here's an, another example, the heart of the matter. So you know in comparison, con people who teach comparison contrast, they say what you have to do is, um, declarative knowledge of form would be there are two kinds of different organizations, XXX, YYY, or XY, 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 XY. But the heart of the matter is noticing similarities, is noting salient similarities or differences that allow you to do some kind of work, right? So, so we only compare stuff in order to do some sort of subsequent work with that comparison. And so the heart of the matter is noticing the differences and similarities that would allow you to do that subsequent work, whether it's arguing that one is better than the other or that they seem the same on the surface, but really are different or that they seem different, but really are the same. Um, so, so that's where, that's where my, um, so this, the inquiry square helped me do that. Now that the outside circles are additions to, to George's initial work on this, because they say you have to attend to the immediate context in which the writing is produced. And then the, how that context is affected by the wider environment around that. So it might be the immediate classroom situation. The wider environment would be something about, um, I don't know, racial politics in the United States or uh, the power differentials, historic power differentials between men and women and so on. So, so once I, um, so really I think that in my teaching of, in my teaching teachers about their teaching of writing, what I want them to think about is what matters most. And I shared this inquiry square with them because as I said, virtually always what matters most is the procedural side. All of these four things you have to have, right? But what's, what matters, typically what matters most is something on the procedural side. And typically what matters most is procedural knowledge of substance. That is how do you get the stuff about what you're going to write? And the other things stem from that. And then when teachers, don't know how to answer the two right columns. That's interesting too. I, that's, I mean, that's an occasion to learn as a teacher, but yes, you'd like to know that often before your students, or at least the two steps ahead of them. Well, that's one of the one of the powers of in, in um, one of the powers of being a writer with your kids is that if you get to that, um, at, but either as a either as a reader or as a, or as a writer, that if, if you're doing the activity, you can test what you're teaching against what you're doing. And I think that that's really powerful. Yeah, I mean, I guess if personally, the, but the emphasis on the how, which is sort of synonymous for the procedural, has made yes. just a tremendous difference in tremendous the way, difference. I, the way I, yeah, just everything. Do you think there is a place for a third category in addition to substance and form called function and I ask that because that's probably the word I use more than any other and I use it as a complement or possibly a contrast to the word form so you know we talk about form and function all the time and if you're looking at form that's nice but the form enables you to do things and what I have found is talking more about function than form has given people uh, many avenues sort of into the form. So, so even like, even like a, a, a rubric that I might write, even if it's like a five paragraph essay, mm -hmm. it would be function, it wouldn't be form. So it look, they look almost the same, but it would be like, you know, the intro does da da da, not the intro has da da da. Because then if you're thinking about what you want to do, there's, you know, then there's many ways to, formalize it and, and, and I think I think that that's so this is I mean that makes sense to me and I think that there's a um, form f I mean yeah. this, might, this might be naive but one, one of the ways that that I understand um, genre theory is that mm -hmm. those two go together so if we if we put genre instead of form mm -hmm. then it would get both form and function because the with the recognition that the form comes from the function mm, that's interesting another thing this circle 
made me think about as you were talking was the idea of like nest, nested concepts because you could see how what the you know the white is inside the pink inside the the blue and if you sort of telescope your lens into one specific box or maybe into the pink or into the wider environment the blue moving that camera lens around allows you to see things that you otherwise might not if you're bogged down in one particular area and, and this is uh, I'm getting well, it would it would also it would also help you see um, so I'm thinking when you were talking Anthony I was thinking about um, so different different you, your kids are going to come to you with different historic relationships with, I mean, so that's what Ways with Words, among all, any other text, teaches us, right? So that if you come having, having been growing up to be deferential to text, the way that you mind text is going to be different than, so, than someone who had, um, who came from a different, even a different religious tradition. Mm bringing things in. So my point being so that the act the activity of your students is going to be a function of their both their immediate situation that's the work that you've done with them to authorize them as readers and writers but there's also going to be you know the politics of the classroom and how those play out that they're going to be authorized in different ways based on their whatever status hierarchies are in your class which are going to be informed by the wider situation in which they're operating yeah and that, that's making me think about setting and and the way that you have approached the concept of setting for example is really interesting whereas uh you know classically setting equals time and place you you and, and some of your colleagues have talked about different levels of setting different dimensions of setting and even i, I mean even the setting of our conversation right now could be interesting to, to look well, at. i i think I think what happens is that um, disciplines have conceptual tools, right? And, and in teaching literature, the conceptual tools might be the literary elements. And I think sometimes those elements, the toolishness of those elements, we forget because in search of, of, over, of simplifying into the definition. So, to me, setting as the time and the place, I mean, that's just, that's, that's not useful. So, I mean, first of all, we have to understand setting as, as rule setting, that is different contexts put different, create the occasion, I mean, make certain sorts of activity impossible and sanction certain sorts of activity. Now, that doesn't mean the character has to do it, but the setting is going to impose different sorts of situations, different sorts of constraints mm -hmm. uh, on, on your behavior. So yeah, so we, we, we think about, we, we want students to be thinking about is, first of all, we want them to be thinking about the nested, I mean, the, the nested context. So is, the, is this most salient aspect of setting what's happening interpersonally, which is, would be the smallest one, or is it? So that would be like you and me talking. You and me, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. that, I mean, this conversation is informed by the fact that we've known each other for, I don't know, how long, Anthony? 25 years, probably. Wow, yeah. 20 years, something. Anyway, a, a number of years. Mm. Um, and so that, that, that could be. But that's, um, but that's, but maybe what's most salient is uh, something that's, a, that's bigger. So there's a context. I mean, there's a difference between... Um, middle school teacher and college professor right so that that's a little bit bigger and now we're doing it we're doing this on zoom because of the coronavirus that's a bigger mm. which aspects as as somebody telling a story about this interview you different you could privilege you know you could write a story interviews in the time, time of the coronavirus which would be about the, the, the big macro Mm. Or it could be um, getting together with an old friend, which would be the micro, mm. right? Um, and, and then there are different the aspects of the setting. I mean, sometimes and then the, the the mid level would be called is that called the meso? Meso, yeah, yeah. Okay, 
And then potentially, like uh, one person can believe the salience is on one level, and another person can see the salience at a different level, and all sorts of productive or unproductive things could happen in that mismatch. Yeah, I had a, a years ago. I was teaching um, in a uh, community literacy project. I was teaching Alice Walker story everyday use. Do you know it? Yeah, I love it. Okay. Um, I, I I have I have lived that on some level. <laughs> the you know I went I went to college and and learned new things and thought I knew everything. Uh, <laughs> well, the quickly realized that wasn't the case. But you could so one of the things that was really interesting. I always read that story as a micro story, as a, the, the the micro level. Um, that what it was about is the relationship between D who goes away and thinks she knows everything. And, and her sister and her mom, right? So when I was teaching this community literacy, one of the participants was really articulate and what he, what he read the story about is about how does, um, what's the important, how does one generate pride in one's race? In this context, we need, so he read it as a macro, he read it as a macro story, changed, so his attitude towards D was entirely different okay. yeah. from my attitude because he was making a macro political argument about if we don't put those kinds of artifacts in museums, then we're not going to have, we're not going to see the possibilities. We're not going to, as a race, see the possibilities that exist for us that are going to affect the way we respond to, we think about ourselves and we think about our families. So it was, but that was that would be yeah. it was really interesting yeah, and that's really cool and that could I guess in a classroom setting or even a personal setting that could be a deliberate move whereas uh, you know we're going to look at this level of the setting now and then we're going to look at this level of the setting and then we're going to zoom way out and uh, you know then we'll share all the things we, we see or even we possibly see. or even possibly you know don't even tell the student Michael's going to look micro and Anthony's macro and then come back mm -hmm. to the conversation. Well, like yeah, you, I, I think you could. Do, I think you could do both. But it, I mean, it gets, that sort of gets to the idea of the heart of the matter. I mean, the heart of the matter in um, in in setting is to what ex what are the forces that are affecting the activity in this in this story, right? Setting as character, almost. So. Uh, well, I mean, I, I think of them as. I, I think Set it, setting setting as living thing was setting setting as uh, setting as the environment that that puts that has sort of a differential push to different kinds of things right so that for example I mean if kids read um, I'm mean, a classic text uh, a classic text. I can think it's in every 10th grade anthology in the United States is the necklace, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if you read the story, if you don't understand that she had a limited set of options, then you just dismiss her and you something there. So that's that the point of the setting is not what year was it set, but what was available to women during that time. Mm -hmm. of what was available? What were the choices available to women of her class of her time? And then that affects the way that you that you can think about it. That seems to me to be the heart of the matter. Yeah, but, and this, sorry. Um, well, I was just gonna say with character. Um, can I pause for a moment and linger on saying yeah, just for, and I sure. know I'm mindful of your time. So um, okay. uh, I wanna say one quick thing about setting and then a little mm -hmm. divergence. Uh, I, I think about genre as, setting like that's one of the main metaphors that i use in my head that every genre or every form is that's is a setting and i believe the uh levels and dimensions of setting actually maps onto that concept really nicely but i don't want to discuss that right now too much but can you but maybe after you talk about the dimensions i think there's like three or four dimensions of setting that you guys have mapped out I don't know if that's changed uh, over time. I use this with my students, and, and it's well, productive. Yeah, what, uh, which ones do you use? Uh, temporal, physical, social. Psychological. Social and psychological. Yeah. A better way to say it. 
Can you t t tell us like a little bit about what that is? Well, um, so if we think about the, if, if you think about how stories work, and we think about the idea of setting as, in the, in the book we talk about setting as rule setting, that is, mm. that environments give rise. Did you, say, did you say setting as rule setting? As rule setting, yeah. Okay. Is that there, in certain environments, certain kinds of activity is sanctioned and other kinds of activity is, is not sanctioned. Um, so, I mean, an obvious example would be, um, in a story like to build a fire it's the physical that that matters right it's the immediate physical surroundings that mean um certain things for him so mm -hmm. so for example I, I don't want to get into the weeds in that story and i haven't read it for some time but at the beginning of the story he spits and it freezes in midair mm -hmm. so that means that it's kind of colder than 70 below zero which means that there's certain things that he should be doing and certain things that he shouldn't Right, but that, but that's a physical dimension of uh, of setting. Um, sometimes, what matters, and, that, and that's so. That's one way the physical the, the physical dimension of setting can dictate, but so can, can but so can right. but so can the others, right? Or, or it, at least, if not dictate, a hundred percent. You know, they can influence heavily, right? But it probably probably the decade in which that story is set doesn't matter so much. Mm -hmm that the temporal dimension is not as important. Whereas as, if we're thinking about um, what, what choices are available to women characters in a story, the temporal dimension is what might, is what might matter, right? So, um, so anyway, so that's, what, that's the idea that we, that we play with. Just to think about what's, think about most salient in either fostering certain kinds of activities or inhibiting certain kinds of activities. And then you, you understand characters largely in terms of how they respond to those different pressures, I think. Okay, so then you're really moving character and setting into sort of dialogue with each other. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then but, you know, th theme and conflict would emerge sort of naturally from that organically because, because uh, conflict is going to be linked to setting to some yes. extent you know, because setting is going to dictate the the norms and the abnorm you know the non-norms and whatnot um, and, and it gets i mean sometimes it, 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 so we we forget sometimes in our, in our teaching um the utility of these tools so what does conflict become right man versus person versus person person versus herself person versus nature well look i, I don't get that I mean, I don't, that, I just don't think that that tells you much, right? Um, so if, I guess as a litmus test, if you can um, completely engage with a literary term by virtue of the cover of the book, it's probably not of much utility to help kids engage with the book, if you see what I'm saying, which, you know. Well, I, I, imagine, I imagine time and place and uh, maybe even basic characterization uh, concepts and for conflict, you know, six or seven different types of, I imagine that being useful for basic comprehension. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. And sometimes that, sometimes that is the first step or no, or, or, or can other approaches to setting and conflict character be aside from the traditional approaches? Can those other approaches provide like a side door or back door into comprehension even better than the straightforward? Well, I, I, um, I think I think that, you know, when we're talking about teaching the teaching of literature is that what we want to do is we want to create instruction that, um, that really matches to the extent that it can what people's, what experience readers go through. So character would be another, and both in text and what people do outside of text. So, um, so I used to think, for example, bad teaching I have done, part two, was that, um, Character, I thought that you got to know characters by virtue of building up from details so that you would build a character from details. But that's not the way things work in, in our lives. We were, um, you know, being in this quarantine, we're watching more TV than we had. And we were watching the show Last Tango in Halifax, which I would recommend. But anyway, 
we were talking, we just started watching it. We started, so I asked my wife, why do I like her? I made like an immediate judgment mm. of, so what we do, I think in our lives is that we make a judgment about a person largely on the basis of their membership in different demographic groups and our initial encounters with them. And then we either confirm that or adjust it based on what we've come to learn. So that's, um, that's a different way of thinking about character than building things up from the bottom, which is not how we do it in, in I, life. Yeah, I made a little poster in my classroom a few years ago about that. And uh, it was basically like, like pay, pay attention to your gut impressions, and like the like gut reactions count. And as a side note, I have, I have noticed that often gut reactions are sort of beaten out of people as they get more educated, so to speak. And uh, gut reactions that sort of have this, this uh, you hold your nose, but, but that's kind of a side point. And I, I, well, think, I, I think the, you have to be in touch with your gut reactions and then modify, modify as new evidence comes in. Um, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, and that, that's an art form in itself. Maybe it's not, maybe it's just natural, but, but modify as, you know, does, does the new evidence confirm or, or should you, or should you adjust your impression? But, but, uh, just notice that oftentimes people have, they seem to, uh, to especially when it be like early college students, for example, you just, uh, you have to abandon all your impressions for some reason. I, I think that that's right. And, um, Peter Rabinowitz has convinced me that in a large measure, that's a function of the fact that teachers teach texts that they've read many times to kids who are reading them for the first time. So you don't have the gut reaction so much five times through. Okay. Yeah. And, and so what, but what you do have is an appreciation for nuance and more intellectual stuff. At least that's my experience. Um, yeah. I think it's a fun way to go through a book, you know, just constantly update or, 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 uh, just your theory about different characters. I think that's a teacher's college terminology. You know, like you start building a theory early on and then where you have a hypothesis and then you sort of adjust it as you go. And one of the things we have to do as teachers is make sure that our students do adjust because sometimes they don't. Right, of course. Yeah. Michael, I think it's probably getting a little late and I know you're a busy guy and uh, uh, if you'd like to continue this like in another session sometime, I would absolutely love it. And I'm sure anybody watching would appreciate that. So what do you say? I, first of all, I've very much enjoyed talking with you. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and I would like to hear more about your teaching. So okay. yes, let's, let's do it. Let's do another one. Yeah. Whether we hit the record button or not, we'll uh, definitely hook up again. That, that's the deal. Well, thanks so much. And, uh, you know, stay safe and all that good stuff. Yeah, you too. Okay. All Take right. Care. Thanks Take so much. Take care. All right. Yep. Bye.